Hi, I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics located in Southgate, Kentucky. And welcome to Wheel Talk. Hey guys, we've loved answering all of your questions so far. If you'd like to hear your question on the podcast, please send them to us on Instagram at Wheel Talk Podcast or by email to wheeltalkpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. We got it. We're live. Oh shit! Lights out and away we go. I didn't do a. We're live. I didn't do a little tester. Okay, we're good now. My levels are normal. Um, hi Ryan. You didn't get my joke, but all right. I didn't hear we'll it. Just move I'm past sorry. That. I was so focused on my my audio levels. <laughs> I said lights out and away we go. Oh. <laughs> Hi. I feel like I have so Hi. much to tell you. I don't it's just been a whole week. Like a, just a whole week. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot. Yeah. The It does seem like these like time periods of kind of getting longer. You don't realize all this stuff that happens in the last week since we last talked, but I'm trying to think back to the weekend and like what I did over the weekend, but I can't really remember honestly. I'm trying You're to at home, but Yeah. I did nothing All right, this so weekend. what's new with you? Um, oh, this is new. I'm going to start. Okay, so um, let's see. Yeah. Um, and I don't have my water, so I'll be right back. What? I can't just talk. I don't have my water. Where is it? Right, is it upstairs? Just... No. I'll be quick. Okay, fine. All right. Hold, hold, peeps. Tell them a fun story. Okay, I will. Okay, here's my fun story. Actually, not really fun, but um, Ryan's birthday is April 20th, 420, um, which I think is funny because it's pot day, but it, like it would be funny if we, you know. Anyway, on April 20th, you should wish him a happy birthday. And his wife's birthday is March 19th. So um, if I remember correct, yeah, I think it's March 19th. And uh, so that's in like three days. Anyway, um, okay, he's back. <sighs> he's back. He's back. I literally ran. Good job. Um, okay, so there's a few things that I've been thinking about this week. And one of them is... The fact that, you know how like we always say, like if you, you have to buy, if you want to fire to cone six, you should always buy a cone 10 kiln because you don't want to like overwork the machine and mm -hmm. you know, you want to make sure that you get the full life out of the elements. I've been thinking about that <laughs> and cars really, except for F1 cars, just regular cars, how we never want to push them to the max because they won't last as long and then i was thinking about humans and how like why are we pushing ourselves a hundred percent if um we don't expect anything else in this world to be pushed to a hundred hundred percent i was like what's the fucking point i am now and forever forever in the future shooting for 75 percent how do you how do we as humans know what a hundred percent of our capacity is? I don't think we do, but I, I, I do think that we have signs like burnout and stuff like that, you know? Mm hmm Like being able to Because there's some people that can do extraordinary things on a daily basis. Like Correct. could you believe there are people out there that run a marathon every single day? Yeah, fuck that. No, thank you. Um Like that just seems like you're pushing yourself way hard. Like, yeah, I think that like, every human know. is different. There are different. Free humans out there. But I also think that it's just dumb to be like, I'm going to go, 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 go. So I'm starting, I'm 75%. That's my, <laughs> that's my goal. That's my, <laughs> that's my max. Um, and I'm really comfortable with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so there's that. I mean, I think some people, some people's brains and stuff can handle that like agreed you know a car can go 160 and you can get it up to 140 and it kind of like it struggles it's kind of moving a little it's kind of shaking a little bit but it's like it still stays on track and it's still like controllable and then there's people that that's not healthy though it's not controllable at like 120 or like 100 <laughs> yeah you know? i also do think that like 
like uh, the capacity of a human being is obviously very, it varies a lot. Um, and like what, mm -hmm. so <laughs> I was thinking about when Isaac, I showed Isaac Shu something once and um, he was like, God damn it, Becca, if you actually cared, <laughs> like what? If you actually cared, you could do so many things. And you're like, it's true. I could. Like, my capacity as a human is, like, super, super great. Like, I'm an extremely intelligent human being. And I have all of these ideas and all of these things that I want to do. Or I don't want to do, but I could do. And um, mm -hmm. I just don't want to do them. And so I don't. But um, still, with with not doing those crazy things, I'm still a great human being, you know, and I've still accomplished a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so my, cap I think you put the, you put that on yourself really of like what, how much you want to push yourself. Yeah. I think you have to want to put that on yourself. Yeah. Like being pushed from external forces or other people is not the best way to refine that. But if you want to push yourself to like 95% or 80% on a regular basis, I still think you can, like, not excel is the right word, but, like, you can really refine and kind of hone your your possibilities if yeah. you do push yourself on a regular basis. Kind of like, you know, you, you build the best muscle when you're strained, probably, than when you take it easy. Like, walking is not going to build you as much muscle and, like, right. refinement and tone as running and like really straining and testing your capabilities and getting your heart pumping, you know? Right. Anyway. So. I like walking. But um, moving on. <laughs> uh, with that being said, I've also decided that I want to start painting more. And so um, I bought some canvas from a buddy who has a roll of canvas. It's like 50 yards of canvas. <laughs> 50 yards of canvas? Yeah. Do you just get it? Is it just on like a cardboard roll? And it's yeah. just yeah okay and it was like i've never seen canvas like that i just assumed it i heard people stretching canvases but yeah well uh. i bought a whole roll and um i mean it was a hundred bucks which that roll is worth like a thousand dollars so um damn will pay for itself um and so anyway i'm gonna start doing small paintings and i think that i'm gonna start i think that this next update that i do i will also sell paintings so i'm kind of excited about that i don't oh fun know how people are gonna respond to it because i don't know are you gonna stretch them are you gonna put them on something no or are you just gonna have them i love canvases like loose? loose so mm -hmm. i think that i might do like a top and a bottom and have them be loose in the middle so it kind of looks like a scroll i don't know exactly how i want to do it but also, I've actually never seen anybody have a canvas like that besides you, because there's one that you have at your have two. apartment that's like that. I have two. You have two of them. Okay. Yeah, and I I love them. I love loose canvases, and I um, I feel like I think that depends on what you paint on it. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that what you paint on it has to be loose to mm -hmm. make it work. Because I was like, if you did your tight lines, like your fancy cups, tight lines, right, angular geometric that would not necessarily mesh with a loose canvas yeah it depends we'll see. maybe we'll see depends but on the background i'm yeah i'm really excited and i don't know how people are going to respond i don't know if people are going to like it or not but um i want to do it so that's what we're doing should be easier to ship right so much easier to ship roll it up and do you roll stick it can you a... roll it up yeah i guess you can yeah so much easier to ship so oh yeah yeah i'm excited you know sweet but you just use acrylics on the canvas yeah okay yeah because you already had a bunch of acrylics and stuff i mean you've been like painting wood and things like that i've been painting for years i think that people yeah. don't actually realize that like i went to art school so like i and when i did uh, I, I, when I made, like, I didn't major, when I got my bachelor's, I did ceramics, but I also did, like, abstract painting, and so, um, it just wasn't as, I wasn't as focused on that, and so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I know how to paint, um, <laughs> yeah. but, yeah. Well, I mean, you have to have that skill set to do some of the fancy cup 
Oh, for sure. Things that we've talked about on past episodes with the underglaze and slip. Yeah, for episode sure. Episode that we talked about and like I know nothing of painting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, also, this is just relative to today. Did you know that the Walmart facility in downtown, like not downtown, but like west side of Indy burned down today? It was a million square feet. Like an actual customer store or is it like a warehouse? It's a warehouse, like a distribution warehouse. It like lit on fire today. I don't know if it's all burned down, but I like miraculously there was a thousand a thousand employees and all of them got out safe damn so far only Did one they say what the cause and the i don't know start of it was i don't know but so far only one firefighter has been injured so wow that's pretty mar- like amazing that's a huge facility a, a huge it's been burning all day Oh my gosh! Yeah, I was like driving. I mean, you home. gotta imagine facilities that big these days. Like they've got to have so many, like heavy mach, so much heavy machinery and stuff in there. And I wonder about like the sprinkler system. Like, does that not work, or was it like it must have been? Yeah, like the machinery. Like you can't put water on it or something. I don't know. Like an electrical fire. Mm. Yeah. Because like buildings that big have to have sprinkler systems. You said they had a thousand employees. A thousand employees. No, a thousand square in there. Holy shit! A thousand employees a inside place. the building, and they said it was a million square feet. Oh my god! I can't even comprehend what that means. A million square feet. That is humongous. <laughs> oh my gosh! I just imagine a bunch of like robots running around <laughs> in there, like getting pallets and moving boxes and I putting know. things on conveyor belts. Like, why do they need a thousand people in there? I don't know. But it's a million square feet, so. Wow. Even big is a million square feet. That's so fucking huge. Uh, I got the million square. I, I mean, didn't read that in an article. So it's a pretty. I read the million square feet. Probably, Rebecca yeah. told me. But I trust her. Okay. She's but I mean, it's being an indie, it's pretty centrally located. So I'm sure they deal with a lot of distribution over Yeah. a large area. I, I wonder if that'll have smoke. effects on. Yeah, I could see the smoke from work. I was like, what's that? And then I got home. Because your work is kind of, what, a little bit east of downtown? E- northeast, yeah. 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 But, yeah, you can it see it. all the way on the west Oof. side of downtown. Wow. Crazy. Anyway, how is your well, I mean, week? a million square feet. Huge. Huge. Um, this weekend, stayed in the house, which is nice. Got a lot of studio time in. And I'm trying to remember what I did. I mean, I've just been throwing a bunch of shit, so... Filling up the greenware, loading, uh, firing. I just unloaded a glaze kiln tonight. It turned out really good. So nice. I'm like two or three loads in on the uh, medium firing schedule. My God. I'm all in on it. All in. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember any like epiphanies I had or any things I was thinking about that I wanted to chat about. I don't know. I didn't come very prepared. That's okay. Um, it's Inseka week this week, so I was like thinking of you know I'm seeing people's posts about Inseka going on, and we did not attend this year, so we will be in attendance next year because it will be in Cincinnati. So looking forward to that, but having a little FOMO seeing people's posts. But yeah, and if anybody wants to pay for us to be there, not like regular people, when we're talking like businesses, <laughs> I'll suck up to you once. I might. I mean, I might, I might have a little in with Speedball. I think Speedball would obviously pay for me to be there. Well, fuck year. you, Ryan. Fuck you. Can't you just like use a product? Like, can you buddy up with like Dirty Girl Tools or uh, Kentucky Mudworks? They'll definitely be there. Buddy uh, up with Link. Well, yeah. Obviously, I want Link to pay me to be there. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Um, I would absolutely like demo for Link. There you go. By the but way, did I you, can't, did you know I there's a new, like... Go ahead. I can't in good conscience. <laughs> <laughs> you can't represent a company without shitting on them at least once. <laughs> you're not your true self if you don't shit on them at least a little bit. I just can't in good conscience represent any of the companies in the pottery world because they'll fucking suck. I'm sorry, but they do. Like, all of them? Speedball all bats of them. are bumpy. Speedball bats are like 
my hands were like vibrating on the bat and like <laughs> okay they can't handle your production it's all right it's maybe just, you got too much <laughs> gunk on the bat pins and they're not in there securely I don't no know. no it's the fucking plastic it's not flat <laughs> it's that's flat enough for me i don't understand that but what about the clay? You don't like Kentucky Mudworks clay? Uh, no, you use it I all the time. Obviously, Kentu- there's some. No, I okay. They're the only, only company I could probably. <sighs> I could. What about Advancer shelves? Don't you feel good about your Advancer shelves that you've used? My God, if Advan. Oh shit! Sorry. I think she just spilled something. Did you spill a drink or something? No, but I hopefully didn't break Rebecca's keyboard. Um. <laughs> It like fell off. That keyboard was that keyboard moving a little bit, and you had to. I was had trying to, quiet to get it, down it back. I put it on the puffs box. <laughs> and <laughs> oh no! I was trying to get it back, and then it fell on the floor. Oh no! Chris there's gonna, gonna be keys. Just me. she's gonna miss a J or something out of Probably. there. Probably. Anyway, um, yeah. No. There's some companies you're just not digging deep enough. Like That's there's true. some companies you would overall you would have a positive outlook on than negative yeah and i heard i heard diamond core was was uh was growing on you a little bit at isaac's i'm sorry is isaac a liar yes <laughs> i heard it was growing on you is it not no diamond core is not growing on me i'm sorry i would like <laughs> what if you didn't have to pay for it I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Like, I can't. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I just Mako. You like Mako stroking coats? I do love the, Mako. The, the... If Mako wanted to sponsor me, I would be more than happy. I think that's your best route, honestly, because your cups. I don't know how they are with social media and the like. You know, accounts that share their stuff, but I think that's honestly like Kentucky Mudworks first, probably because, Link. you know, they already know you and we talked with Link. And then I would say Mako. God. Because your stuff would be, would set out a part in Mako, probably. I would fucking And you could actually talk about. Love you know. to be sponsored by Mako. I don't have a, I don't have anything wrong to say with them. They have great stuff. You just got to kiss, you just got to kiss a little ass, Becca. <sighs> I'm so bad at that. Um. I feel like you'd have to kiss less ass at Mudworks. Truth. Truth. Yeah, I tried to get her to give me one of those, um, the bat systems that fit on the uh, Shimpo Aspire, and she, the dirty girl bat system, yeah, yeah. and uh, and she was, I was like, you know, I would love to test that, and she, it just like went right over her head, and I was like, come on, Link, <laughs> uh, people keep tagging me in that speedball um, comp giveaway thing. Yeah, giveaway for, uh, for Enzika, and I'm like, I'm, mm, mm-hmm. I don't want any of those products. <laughs> but you can keep tagging me. Somebody actually messaged me today, and they were like, "Hey, I tagged you in this. I hope you don't mind." And I was like, "Yeah, I don't really care when people tag me and stuff yeah, like me that either. because it's not a big deal." And then I. They were like, I wasn't sure about Becca because I feel like she wouldn't like it. And I was like, she probably wouldn't care. Like, you I can don't. tag her. So, you can tag it me. It might have been the same if person. If you need there. a person to tag, tag me. It's fine. Just don't expect or me to Or you can tag Wheel Talk Podcast. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel so All right, bad so you got, that I'm. You got, a, you got a year, Becca, to get in with somebody. Okay. I'll start tagging Mako in my things. And then I'll it would, send them an email. It doesn't take anything. And and then people, also it answers people's questions. Like some people probably wonder what, I don't know if you get questions about what underglazes are they, or, or you know, are they underglazes, are they glazes, are they stroking coat, are they, you know. Yeah. And the stroking coats are Mako too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. you're you're a Mako girl all around. I am, that I am. There you go. Except for I got yelled at at the Mako uh, workshop when they were like doing the screen printing and the lady was like yeah you can buy, you can buy her screen printing medium and i was like ah oh, just stick it in the microwave 
I was like, just stick the glaze in a glass jar in the microwave. And she was like, do not say that. Do not put your <laughs> glaze in the microwave. And I was like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, God. Anyway, hilarious. moving on. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to do a bunch of questions that are studio practice focused. Okay. Uh, we've been piling up a number of questions and figured it'd be good to kind of hit a bunch of those today to narrow down the list. And you all always send good questions. So keep them yeah. coming. We love them. We love them. Are we starting from the top? From the top? From the top. Oh, also, I made the fucking best tacos today. And yesterday. Best fucking tacos of all time. Okay. Yeah, we didn't even get a photo of it. You were like, this plate had a taco. To be honest, they weren't good looking. But no longer. (laughs) They weren't good looking, but they were great tasting. Okay. Okay. So it was like a pleasant surprise taco. No, I knew they were going to be good. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. (laughs) Okay. First. All right. First question from Purple Full Moon Studio. Do you want me to read it? I can't have a kiln where I live. So I'm starting to plan for the future to rent space so I can fire my work on my time and not depending on others. What questions do I need to ask landlords and how do you find studio space that is ceramic friendly? Thank you. Asking landlords. So it depends on where you're renting, right? If it's right. like a warehouse or a garage. I would assume most people kind of rent out space in like warehouse studio kind of things. But that's Midwest kind of thing. I don't know if that's everywhere that that's available. That there's like buildings that people just rent for cheap because they're in like a iffy part of the city iffy neighborhood right and they're just cheap rent for studio space um yeah i think that like i feel that in the past when i've had studios they've been in like artist community studio type things where it's like a big building and they separate it out into rooms and those rooms are all different artists (laughs) which side note when i was in this studio in seattle I was right next to a fiber artist and I accidentally squirted my paint over the wall into her studio and it was neon orange and I was freaking out and I like climbed up on my table on a chair on the table to look over and her there was like there was like fabric everywhere. And I was like, holy fuck, I probably just ruined her fucking painting. Like it was like a paint she did like fabric painting i think it missed it but oof and then i like had to put a note under very sketchy anyway there was one you just write a note just like <laughs> paper airplane it over there and just be like all right <laughs> there was one it. ceramic artist i remember in the studio and sometimes in those um situations if there's not enough space within your space usually a landlord's like prepared for that if it is an art type studio and they can hook the kiln up somewhere else like in the studio that i'm in right now our setup like our room was specifically designed to have kilns like it was specifically designed to be a ceramic space so yeah your studio itself your small studio my small like room within our huge building um because a a ceramic artist had been there before but um usually they just you just need to have it near a breaker and they put in the um you usually have to pay for the wiring and the you know the breaker box Mm -hmm. and all that stuff Uh, Or they can put it in a separate part of the building. Like there was another ceramics artist in our building and her kiln was in a whole separate room, like on the way into the building. Like I would walk past it every day, you know? So there's different things that you can do. And like, basically you just say, Hey, I have a kiln and I, is that okay with you? They are like a very big oven. Um, It takes the same power as an oven. Uh, you know, a 220 breaker, probably a 50 amp or or probably a 60 amp, um, or less. And, um, I will get the electrician unless you have one, a licensed electrician, make sure you do Uh it on the books. 
make sure you do it on yeah. the books if you are in somebody yeah. else's for the, space. For your sake, for the landlord's sake, you don't want to like have some wiring issue and it's on. It's like, we trust this electrician, but you didn't really like... Because you're in somebody else's building, like they own the building, so you don't want to like yeah. fuck this up. And ask about insurance if you need to get any sort of liability insurance. I'm running into that right now. Um, ask about water, where the nearest water is, if they have any traps, like, you know, glyco traps or anything like that. Ask if they've ever had a ceramic artist before. Um... A regular, like, you know, you could look at those. I've seen some potters get one of those, uh, you know, the garages, like the storage garages. They, like, have studios in those. What storage garage? Like an actual container, like, storage building? No. Have you seen those buildings that are, like, for storing, like, RVs and shit? Like, they're just, like, big garages. Oh. So. I have not seen that, but. I mean, maybe if somebody bought the building and they had huge garage doors, but anyway, yeah, I haven't seen that as much. I'm I'm mostly used to seeing the warehouses and stuff, but yeah, I didn't even think about the water until you said that. But, uh, yeah, I would assume you have to kind of just go with the flow of where the breakers are. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of those big buildings too, they kind of have the big pipes with wire running through mm-hmm. random parts of the building where they will have access to you know, 240 volt or whatever, but... Is it 240 or 220? It's it's 220 because each outlet on a regular outlet is 120 or 110. Okay. Hold on. Maybe it's 120. I don't know. I'm blanking now. I think it is... Anyway, get a I think it's 110 volt. <laughs> I, I think it's 110 volt, so it's double that, so it's 220. Okay, 220. Okay. Get an electrician, like we said. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say, and I think that if you look, you can you can always call like your, um, oh, city council, and um, see if they know of any artists shared spaces in the area. You know, mm-hmm. use your. I would say the best is to just talk with peers of ceramic yeah. artists that you know like rent space and say how do you like your space are there open spaces there i mean there's some local people to me that have rented space that have had some like terrible experiences because then you're mm-hmm. in the mix with your neighbors that are in there and like what kind of situation are they in do you share a breaker box with other people right so if their kilns like trip the breaker then what's good like you can't fire at the same time because they won't handle it or you know is water available? Is it not available? You know? Yeah. And then a lot of the like, are, is it climate controlled or is it like not, which is a big part. Oh yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a pretty common thing. Like you're going to pay pretty cheap if it's not, um, if it's not air conditioned or has a heater or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you know, it's inefficient to run heaters and air conditioning and stuff. Yeah. In your space. So it's like you have to adjust your schedule to fit with what's comfortable to work in. Yeah. I feel lucky because Dusty was the one that found our studio or my studio. And I... yeah, your space is awesome. I don't. Do you all have AC in there? I would I think assume he you do. probably do. I think do, he right? does have AC. Yeah. It's um, ducked. Uh, and my landlord is fucking amazing. And um, he's so chill. You know, I have big windows. And yeah, I lit the dumpster on fire, and he was like, "No worries, it was bound to happen." Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a dumpster fire! What a dumpster fire! Yeah. All right. Do you want to go to the next question? Yeah, I'll do the next question. Um, I'm gonna click that as answered. Um, how do you go about finding a studio space? Okay, we kind of just talked about that. I just moved to Houston and away from community studio, pottery studio I worked out of. I feel like I've exhausted every studio space there, here, but they're either full or don't think my utilitarian pottery is artsy enough for them. Fuck them. Um, that wasn't in the comment. I don't know what it is, what to do. <laughs> Leah Sweet Ceramics. 
I would be like, why do you care what produ- art I produce? Like, am I paying you money? Yeah, fuck you. Am I paying man. my rent? Um. Yeah, I. I don't know. I feel like we're lucky here because in Cincinnati, there's a lot of different options to go to where if you can either take class and you also get access while you're in a class or you can rent an actual like shelf or a booth or like a physical space that is your own and you're paying your own rent. Like there's a lot of different options. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would find it hard to believe that if you have a place that teaches pottery classes, that they would be completely full, not class wise, but like if you could rent space at a studio that like teaches classes, but you just want like a shelf and access to equipment when they're not teaching. Yeah. Like that's the the route I would go because if they own the studio and it's like a small studio or it's a big studio, like as long as they have equipment and you're not like overloading their spots when other people are there. I would think they'd be open to just taking your money as long as they have space to store your shit. Yeah. I'm looking up Houston Pottery Studios. It looks like there's three main ones um, in the area, which I know... Oh, no. It looks like there's more than that, but like... And Houston might be pretty big. I don't know. Yeah, well, and I think that um, obviously they've done their homework. Um Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I'm I'm not like bringing anything new or anything. But I was also thinking that it might be a, an interesting idea if you know if you know of any Houston potters that are established to go and and like if you could if you could uh, manage to get a wheel and you know set up your own kind of studio at your house and then fire somewhere else. That might be a good option. Like if you found another artist that was like, and you were like, hey, can I pay you money just to fire in your kiln or something like that? It's Mm -hmm. like this, this is one of those things that if you had the money, it'd be like, fuck it, just make your own fucking studio and figure it out because Mm -hmm. it sounds like there's no And if you have the space, and if you you rent or something like that and you don't have the space, then all you need is a wheel. Like you don't need perfect space for a wheel and storage. Yeah. You just have to go with the transportation of pots route, but but that's this is also a really hard question to answer because we don't live in Houston, you know, and so it's like, but I feel like Houston is very vibrant, a vibrant city. I would imagine there's a lot of pottery in there, um, mm-hmm. but it's like you know, or if there's a clay collective or community that is there that you can ask, yeah, for referrals or. If you want to just ask the the way of saying like, hey, is there somebody they can fire for us, for me? Um, I didn't go to her Instagram to see if she was. I feel like this is a really making, old um, question. <laughs> I don't know. If it... Maybe. I mean, I've seen Leah come back and forth with us a little bit, so it's not new. Um, new stuff that I've seen yeah, from her. But yeah, it's tough. It depends on how much you're producing, right? Yeah. I'm a, I was a little thrown by the uh, don't think my utilitarian pottery is artsy enough because I would imagine going to a studio and saying, what options do you have? They wouldn't ask what kind of pots do you produce unless you're like, I'm a sculptor. I need a lot of space. Like, that's different. But if it's like, what do you need resource-wise? I need a wheel and I need firing. Like, I wouldn't think the type of pottery you produce really matters. Oh, it looks like she just got a kiln. It looks like she figured out her her shit, you know? Nice. Nice. Yeah, I mean, the kiln's the easier thing to get, I would say, than, like, kiln supply is up. I would say wheel supply is probably a little bit tighter. Leah, your stuff really reminds me of my stuff from the, from, like, when I started. Not started, but like um, the way you're glazing, I like it. Mm-hmm. Like white on the top, colored on the bottom. I have always liked that. Um, cool. Oh, you have a kitty. Well, I'm glad that you figured Jeez. your your. I'm glad you you figured your shit out. 
And we're sorry that we didn't get back yeah. to you. Okay. Eventually. Did you move? All right. Next one you? says, I don't know how to say it. Kitschy ceramics? C I C H Y? How do you say that? Oh. Kitschy? I'll ceramics? let you butcher I'm wondering it. if you had any. <laughs> I'm wondering if you had any episodes that talk about best practices for firing with an old kiln sitter kiln. Thanks so much. When's the last time you had a kiln sitter kiln? 2018. Good old man. Good old manual kiln. So I had a. I had a. Well, actually, 2016 probably. I had a manual kiln, and then I got the box to convert it. Like rig it up, yeah. Yeah, Seattle Pottery makes the box where you just plug in the manual kiln to the box and then it reads the thermocouple. Like you just install a thermocouple in it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have one of those boxes? No, all of no, yours... No, you mean one that you like mount on the wall. Mine are all attached. Yeah, mine you mount, mount it on the wall. Um, but yes, I fired with a old kiln sitter kiln for a long ass time and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um i don't think we have talked about that but um yeah i don't even think we talked about it in our kilns 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 episode we were talking mostly about electronic controllers because if you're buying a new kiln i would say there's probably no reason to buy a new kiln sitter kiln yeah like a new manual kiln i don't think they money. make kiln sitter kilns new they don't. I would say they probably I don't. don't. I do, however, miss the... Um, what I miss about having a, a kiln sitter kiln <laughs> is that that kiln... The, <laughs> Waking up at 3 a.m. to turn it up? I or? don't miss that, no. Um, <laughs> In the middle of the winter? Oh, God, your that front was porch? the fucking worst. I had to go down two flights of stairs outside, down into my basement. Ugh the worst um <laughs> but what i miss about having that when i had the box that was the electronic controller was um the safety of having that kiln like the cone in the kiln sitter because it a would timer shut on it there? off regardless like if it got i'd always put a, a bar seven bar cone so it would never get hotter than cone seven like if the kiln if the um electronic controller yeah. mishap i'd always have a safety <laughs> and i loved that and right. i think that they should implement safeties in the electronic kilns personally but it's fine i mean what would that there, there probably are some kind of safety mechanisms no there's no manual don't. safety mechanisms like you can't put a kiln a cone in there and like when that cone would drop well like, no cone but what you're saying the controller, but why would the controller go above the temperature you want if it's reading? Like, what would have to happen to the thermocouple for it to how actually many, go above the top how temperature? How many times have you seen somebody post on Clay Buddies, oh my god, it went way too hot, and now my kiln's ruined? I don't know how that happens, though. Is that user error where they set yes, cone 6? Yes, it's user error. They accidentally, instead yeah. of 06, they do 6? Yeah, so How it's do you like fix that? you put a fucking kiln with a cone sitter, and then when that cone hits seven, it's like, boom, off. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's good enough. I mean, if they can't, if they don't realize they're typing in six versus oh six. Everybody makes mistakes, Ryan. Anyway, uh, we don't I know, have... but you're not going to fix it. I don't know. We're not, don't know, we maybe. don't have one for old kilns that are kilns, but I think it would be a good idea to like, do we know anybody that has a kiln that are kiln that, um, has been firing? I mean, what like general tips years? would you have? I would, I would say I had to be a little more cognizant of keeping witness cones within the peeps. I had to use those quite mm -hmm. a bit when I was using a kiln sitter. That's a big that's a big thing to remember, especially yeah. as you're learning how to fire kilns and understand how temperature differs from bottom, top, middle, and how mm -hmm. to load it. So yeah, and I always I think you definitely have to space things out more with a kiln sitter because the 
the kilns that are in the middle is really going to determine when it shuts off, but like you can't, I mean, you can control it. You can like turn it back on and stuff, but like keeping things spaced out more and not overloading it is probably more necessary with a kiln sitter, like keeping it, it open to like air flowing from top to bottom. Bullshit. I don't know. I had more issues with, I had more issues with not firing consistently top to bottom in my kiln sitter. Maybe it's I because had you had a shitty time. kiln. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I had that like Duncan one that was like brand new. The Duncan teacher kiln? The Duncan teacher. Yeah. Ah, oh, bless. I fucking love that kiln. I had that one up till like 2018. I think it was 2018. If somebody offered me a Duncan teacher kiln that was a kiln setter kiln, just like cones, no electronic controller, like one of those teacher kilns, I would fucking take it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. A heartbeat. Yeah. Great for bisking. Um, I would say also use bars. Don't use the, do not use the um, triangular triangles. Cones. Bars are a hell of a lot more pr like um, reliable, reliable. And consistent. Yeah, um, time your time your firings to make sure that if something does go wrong, like the like one time my uh, cone melted in the wrong space and it held the kiln sitter in place. Make sure that you're timing your firing so that if it goes past that time, you're like, what the fuck is going on? And you check. And so that kind of contradicts what you said earlier, that the cone is going to be your fail safe well, unless it sticks in place. It's not a perfect system, okay, Ryan? <laughs> Nor is electronics, which are consistently not correct. Based on what the user puts in. I don't know. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Nothing works perfect all the time. But anyway, time your time your firings. You should be timing your firings. Um, I always... Definitely. Kill and log, for sure. Yeah. I always did my firings as two hours, two hours, two hours, and then let it go. Like, two hours, bottom elements, two hours, um, all the elements with the lid open, two hours, medium... Two hours, bottom elements with the lid open. Two hours, all elements with the lid open. Two hours, low with the lid closed. Two hours, medium. And then set to high. And I feel like that's kind of fast, but maybe not. Is that for bisque and glaze? Y no. For glaze, I would just do... I'd probably do one hour... Uh, bottom elements, two hours, top with the lid closed, um, top and bottom, then two hours medium, and then high. Okay. I feel like I, yeah, I, when I have, it's been such uh, a long time, I can't even remember. Yeah. I mean, I've kept some kiln logs from my first, and I got a, I got a couple kiln logs that I could probably put on my blog or something from how I was tracking my kiln loads because i would have like a low medium high i would have like a basically a ch chart of like times and then i would say like you know set top to top to low bottom to medium for two hours and then i would like continually change it but yeah i would definitely start my bottom first on low and not even have my top on for right maybe give it an hour or two hour head start and then i would continuously have my bottom like half above so like if i were turning the the top to medium i would turn the bottom to like medium and a half mm -hmm. just because it it never fully like meshed yeah. um and then when i went to high i would just let it coast but here's a trick um if you didn't know this is that the kiln sitter kilns um uh, once your cone drops you can just push in the bar because the way it works is that it drops down and it pushes in a bar and when you bring it back up and reset your kiln it automatically pushes that mm -hmm. little bar out um so what you can do is uh flip up you your can push it back in yeah you can push it back in really uh 
really and then just set the kiln sitter on the bar not you know don't put any pressure on it just set it down if you needed to hold for like 10 minutes or whatever that's how you would hold um yeah i've put like you can even put like a little bitty like a kiln sitter cone on the outside like on top of it to like weight it enough to hold it down yeah um or i've like leaned a little stick or something against it so it like holds it up but i'm always going to be there to like wait for it and stuff otherwise you that's how you have issues yeah but yeah i mean the there's are there fewer things to go wrong with a kiln sitter kiln with like maintenance and stuff i think so probably fucking eat way easier to change out all the elements and shit takes like yeah it's like mechanically they're so fucking simple which is nice yeah i liked mine because they had like the first kiln i had had the like male female on the rings so each ring had their own box and then like it had a male and then the ring below it had a female on the top so you just like stuck them on top of each other and you mm-hmm. just stacked the rings of the kiln like that was nice you didn't have to yeah do the you know plug them and wire them together or open boxes and like wire them together or anything like that which is nice i was just thinking about my uh uh the big kiln that i had it was a seven cubic foot kiln and it was a crew it was a crusader Crusader? kiln. no yes crucible no it wasn't crucible it was a crusader and the whole (laughs) god it was a fucking hot mess the whole bar that had all of the switches in it had just it was a fucking wire mesh and then it had like the um fire padding and then the blanket stuff yeah yeah. and if you turned it when you turned it on you could see sparks (laughs) like like, oh gosh it was so bad (laughs) so bad (laughs) oh god that kill was so bad anyway um yeah so we should do right, there's your kiln sitter yeah i don't know if we have anything else yeah i'll try and see if i can post my kiln log and people can take those download those and use them yeah i'm i'm pro kiln log for sure i mean even today log, so. so all right all right next question i think that is this yours i think this one's yours hmm? to read this is yours to read sure um, this is from Goodwill Ceramics. Uh, says, uh, talk about fuzzy clay mold, would you? I know people get it in their actual clay, and I've heard people say it's not bad health-wise and actually makes their clay a great consistency when it's wedged in. I get it on my masonite bats when I keep stuff in my damp box for a while. <laughs> <laughs> could we could we get Becca to break down the science of it for us? No. Um just wondering <laughs> if <laughs> if it's something to worry at all about. I don't know any science. I'm like bad at science. <laughs> if you want the science, go to the For Flux Sake podcast because they just had episode 15 that came out. It's titled Is My Moldy Bag of Clay Really More Plastic? I have not listened to it, but I feel like this is exactly what Jody's asking about. Yeah, but I also think that... If you that, want the science stuff. I think that you should always be a little bit worried about mold. Like, it depends on if you have a mold intolerance, you know? Like, if you're, like, somebody that is affected by mold, like me, I've been cutting mold off of my cheese for years. Like, I'm fine. But... <laughs> 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 but <laughs> oh, my um, gosh. I don't know. I would maybe avoid trying to put your uh, bats in the damp box if they're getting mold like that. Mostly because I feel like the masonite would break down faster if they get so much mold on them. Um, as far as I mean, my my damp my drywall boards definitely get, get mold. mold. Yeah, yeah, I don't think mold is because if ever I good. if I just put wet if I just put wet pots on them like they'll it'll develop and i think like if i were to cut open one of the dry like the drywall boards like there would probably be mold in there yeah i don't think it's ever good but also it depends on how like i don't know rampant it is or how particular you are like if i see mold i'm like meh it's mold it's fine um if 
somebody else sees mold, like if Rebecca had mold, it would not be okay because she is, she cannot handle that. Like her asthma can't handle that. So I think that it's definitely per person, um, whether that's an issue or not. <laughs> in clay, mm -hmm. wedge it in there. It doesn't matter. I don't think it makes it more plastic. I think it just makes it smelly. Yeah. I don't know much about the plastic stuff, but my, I mean, I would say if you have slip and like sloppy stuff like that is like prime for getting that mold build up. Like my uh, white clay for sure is a big culprit for mold. And maybe Link could answer that in the future for is us. Is that but, when it turns black? Yeah. Oh my God. You should have seen my slot bucket back in Washington. God, if yeah, I mean, it's uh. Yeah, because I, I keep the slot bucket on the wheel head at all times, and then I wipe my hands and all that stuff goes in there. And then I dump that into my reclaim bucket, mix it all in. Like, I think it's good to probably mix in with stuff that's dry. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think it seems good. It's better for it. I don't know. It seems like you're mixing, like, older, like, moldier clay with, like, fresher clay. Or... Yeah. It seems like it would be good, but... Yeah, I do tend to get more mold buildup from that white clay. Especially, like, I have some in my damp box. One of the big damp boxes, I just have a, a drywall board in the bottom. And, like, it can get pretty nasty looking. You should put, instead of a drywall board, you should maybe get some um, hardy backer. I do have some hardy backer. I could probably cut it. Yeah, it's hardy I've backers. Been, a piece I've been of putting cake random shit in there. I've been, I've been putting like the, um, like card pieces of cardboard that fit in the bottom <laughs> in yeah. my extra boxes that are just random because I have like an extra two boxes yeah. that I need pots in. So, but yeah, the I mean plaster is obviously the way to go with that. But I mean even the plaster can probably, I don't. I think the plaster is less likely to have the mold. Mm, who knows? Then. And the drywall, I don't know what it is about drywall that just like sucks it in and just holds it. But well, I mean, just think about it in the house, like houses and stuff have mold. I don't know if there's certain materials that are more conducive to it, but yeah. Fuck in Washington, everything had mold. <laughs> it's like, who yeah. fucking cares? Like I'm sure your basement <laughs> at the old house like had mold everywhere, right? Or yeah, like oh, bits God, of it somewhere. It was so bad. Um. Yeah, me and mold. Takes you back to the home inspections friends, and stuff, where you're like, "I hope there's no mold, or there's a little bit of mold here." It's like it's in a fucking shower. It's not surprising <laughs> that there's little bits of mold. Like, it's conducive <sighs> for that. I once went to somebody's house, and their bathroom had mold all over the ceiling, the ceiling, the whole ceiling. And I was like, "You know that's fucking mold, right?" And he's like, "What? I didn't know that was mold." I'm like, "You are a fucking idiot." Like, <laughs> clean bathroom ceiling, ceiling black. Google dot com. <laughs> okay, here's our next question. I'll just read all the questions. It doesn't matter. You're you don't like to read them. Anyway. All right. Um, this is from Jody again. Um, question number forty three. <laughs> what temp is okay to open my kiln? I do peepholes around five hundred, about an inch around four hundred, two inches around three hundred, and fully open at two hundred or below. Is this too conservative? Answer your you answer. I think that's I think that's pretty I think that's pretty good. Like yeah, if you have the time, that's probably right around what your what your kiln can handle. Yeah, like we've said. Before, yeah, I mean that that's pretty conservative with the peepholes at five hundred. Like that's not really doing much, honestly. Yeah, you could probably open your kiln an inch at five hundred. Right. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not in a rush, so I don't really push it. But if it's yeah. If I'm in a rush, you know, if I'm in a rush, I'll do peeps at 700, about a half an inch at six, an inch at five, um, two inches at four, three inches at three, and then I'll fully open it at about 250, 280. But okay, that's me. I like 280. 280 is like the open. That's like what I open it at, regardless. Um, Even these days. Yeah. With your pots? Yeah. I'll, I mean, like, okay. but um, I also, like, if I'm there when it's 280. Like, if I'm not there, I don't fucking care. Like, it doesn't matter. I'll open it when it's cold. But, um. Yeah. I mean, you, do you remember me telling you about how I used to, like, 
every Friday. You were like unloading them hot, right? Oh, fuck yeah. Every Friday before I go to, um, before I go to Leavenworth and before I had the electronic controller, I would be fucking Googling how hot I could unload pots. I swear to you, I've unload I've unloaded a kiln at 600 before. There's no question in my mind that I have unloaded them at 600 because I had no way of telling the temperature. I didn't have, I didn't even have a manual thermocouple. Like, nothing. I, <laughs> sometimes I'd stick my, like, kitchen thermometer in the peephole and, like... <laughs> <laughs> and that thing would like explode because it's glass it would like are you fucking kidding me it's like going in circles like what are you doing oh my god and i just like would wrap them up in blankets and stuff and like keep them hot i've had a pot almost burn a blanket <laughs> oh my gosh yeah what are you putting them on at that point like they you can't just put them on a t- like they got to go on like marble or something you know oh my gosh yeah so that's my answer. <laughs> I think that that's very And what did you say back then when you told us that story the first time? Do you remember what you said? The risk, the real risk in opening at that temperature, what the the kiln issues are. Yeah, it's the It's the kiln. The pre- your pre- the pressure you're putting on your kiln by opening it cuz the lid Yeah. is not ready. But at to... that point, that kiln was a piece of shit anyway. That was the one with the <laughs> the mesh screen. <laughs> You're like that kiln deserved it. That was a single body crusader kiln that was a seven cubic foot kiln. Do you imagine can you imagine changing the elements to that? It was a fucking pain in the ass. I couldn't imagine a single body seven cubic foot. That thing must have been fucking massive. It weighed so much. The only That's terrible. The only benefit to it was that it had casters on the um on the stand. I mean that's good, but still you've got a you gotta move that some bitch and like pick it up into the back of a truck or whatever. We put it in a trailer. Oh my god, a trailer. There you go. Yeah. Jeez. Took three of us. Just yeah, I mean, to get I'm not. Re- oh my gosh. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be walking through a doorway with that thing. Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm usually mine is all about timing. Like, I am never around the kiln when it gets done, and when, like, typically I'll start my kilns at night, so they're firing. During the morning, they're done by the time I get wake up. So like the the glaze came out just fired a few a couple days ago. Um, it finished at like you know eleven a.m. right, and it's at twenty two hundred ish right, and it's gonna take all day. And then by the end of the night, and I have a vent on the kiln the entire time, so it's venting up, it's venting down. Yeah. And I don't turn it off until it gets to be like a reasonable temp, and then I'm just like okay, I'll let it coast. But like at the end of the night. After it got done at 11, it got down to maybe 350 or 400. But, like, it's midnight or it's 11 o'clock. Like, I'm not going to unload a kiln at 11 o'clock. Yeah, but not everybody's like you. So, I'm just saying, for me, there's no re- there's no reason for me to do that. Yeah. So, it's all about timing of when I start the kiln, when I get it down to a reasonable mm-hmm. temperature. And I pretty much vent it all the way down until maybe, like, if I'm going to bed and it's at 500 coming down then i'll just turn the vent off because i want to save the electricity of not using it throughout the night because it's probably going to be down to a reasonable tent by the morning anyways yeah yeah and i so, think that it should be noted that me and ryan um don't care <laughs> like we are not we're not like we've been doing pottery long enough and we do the same shit all the time every time that opening up a kiln is not christmas to us I think that that should be noted. Yeah. Like I'm not in a rush to unload. Like yeah. unloading the kiln is not because I'm going to a show. It's I'm I plan ahead enough that the kiln that I'm yeah. unloading is likely to restock me for yeah. the, like two or three weeks down the road. Right, and I so think that a lot I'm not of people to a show. A lot of people are really anxious to unload the kiln, which makes absolute total sense. We're just not those people, so we, you know. Yeah, I mean, if I might I'm peak a, yeah, or if I'm but I'm not, gonna, it, I'm not going to crank it open. Yeah. And like, all right, I need to put, like, I'm never putting gloves on at this point to unload my kiln. Yeah. That's how long I wait to unload my I kiln. I rarely do now, too. Yeah. And, and it, like, we're just never in a rush. Like, I think the, the, this last week when I did my pot drop or two weeks ago or whatever, that was the first time in a long time where I was like, got to get the kiln, you know, like, 
to this temp. We got to get it cooling quickly and shit like that, you know. Well, plus you had finishing steps. Like you have to sand it afterwards. So mm-hmm. yours is not done. Like my sanding is like a 30 second sand on the bottom. It's not right intensive sanding on every piece. Yeah. So. All right. Can we jump down a couple below Jody's and then go back up? Yeah. Which one you don't which one do you want to do? That long one? All right. Yeah, Tori. Tori Solis okay. Ceramics. I have a question and it might and it might not be in your wheelhouse because I know you all focus on functional mid fire work, but you're very experienced and you know a ton of folks. So here it goes. <laughs> Does a low fire terracotta vitrify? I know the abs- uh, that's an O4 vitrify. I know the absorption rate is still high above 10% specifically. I am wondering if there is a way to work in a low fire terracotta to make planters that would be strong enough to stay outside in the winter. Would you always be would they always be susceptible to cracking due to absorption of water expanding when they freeze? I enjoy the porosity because it always allows plants um, roots to breathe is susceptible to cold weather just as trade-off for that question mark i see a lot of people in a plant pot auction group i'm in who label their pots as fully vitrified and freeze resistant how could i make a pot that would be freeze resistant would i need to aim for a low absorption rate under two percent and wouldn't i lose the porosity uh i currently enjoy and value Oh, the porosity I currently enjoy in value. Specifically, I'm currently working with Armadillo Longhorn Red Clay. Should I be telling everyone who buys a pot that it needs to come inside for the winter? Wow. That was a long... That was long. I hope that everybody understood that because I... You know, this this just like mm-hmm. brings me back to reading Bible verses in like in high school. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> all right, Becca, can you please read? <laughs> like, let's start chapter at whatever, John verse 5, whatever. chapter 20, and let's go around the class. And then you read like a whole thing, and you're like, there's a lot what of punctuation I that I did not get correctly there. <laughs> <laughs> like, anyway, it was a good question, though. I really actually enjoyed it. I just wish that I could have read it a little bit better it's from oh, tori right, solis ceramics Longhorn red by the way so okay i okay. think that first we should say that you're correct it might be a little bit out of our wheelhouse um i can already tell you that i don't fully know this answer but i feel like <laughs> i feel like Do you want me to read a little bit of what it says about the characteristics of the clay for anybody else yeah sure yeah so again it's it's a uh, armadillo clay Longhorn red, rich terracotta color. It says, for best results, bisque to cone 04, then glaze to cone 06. Shrinkage, plus or minus 2%. And it says the shrinkage rate is 7.6%. Okay. So that's if you're glazing to cone 06. Absorption, plus or minus 1%. And the absorption is 8.75%. Okay. So... I feel I'm like you the difference answered between the absorption and the shrinkage. I feel like you answered your question within this question. Yeah, I think it's a trade-off, right? If you're going to use that clay, part of it being terracotta is it's going to have um, a high absorption, and if you can't go higher than Kono six to minimize the absorption, then you know, I mean, that's the characteristics of a terracotta, right? I don't. I mean, how do you even, Well, f- I don't see how you have planters and stuff that are not glazed on the inside that are not going to break in a freeze. If they have any kind of absorption, they're probably going to be prone to cracking anyway. Do those right? little, do the, I don't, I also do not do planters. Like, I'm, I mean, I make planters, but I don't do plants. Like, that's not my thing. I have one plant, his, you know, I have one plant, his name's Bert, and he... <laughs> He lives at the studio and I water him once a week and that's as much as I can handle. So, um, my, here's, okay, the first, let's break this down. The first question is, 
Does a low fire O4 terracotta vitrify? No. Can it vitrify? Can a low fire clay vitrify? Yes. Does a terracotta And what are we considered vitrify? Vitrify. We're considered vitrify as in absorption plus minus like 2%. 2%. It's kind of. Mm-hmm. I have seen a cone three clay vitrify. I've never seen anything below that vitrify. Um, of course, we don't know all the answers, so we could be wrong. But um, I would say no. A low fire terracotta will oh not vitrify. Oh my gosh. Some of these other like low fire clays on armadillo are like such high absorption. <laughs> Okay, so and then as you yeah. said, you can't you can't imagine a um, pot not cracking in the winter. Do those brown pots crack? The ones that you get at Lowe's? Yeah. Okay. They would crack. So in that case, in that case, it makes absolutely perfect sense to bring them, say, bring them in the winter. You know, bringing them inside the winter. Just a quick thing on your yeah, card. Yeah, some or way whatever. to keep them from dropping below freeze, below freezing. Yeah, I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, "Hey, don't." Just make sure to bring them inside, yeah. or they're gonna break. Yeah, and just do a little sticker or something, you know, or like a little printout that you can cut out and with every pot sold. Um, and those people that say it's fully vitrified and freeze resistant must be doing uh, like a cone six clay for their planters. Yeah, I would say it would, it would definitely have to be. Or they just don't know what the fuck higher... they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, the making it freeze resistant, you'd have to sacrifice the terracotta or the loaf the yeah. that um i'm saying terracotta because terracotta is normally a higher absorption right it's not you're not like fully vitrifying terracotta that i know of but i also don't think it's your responsibility to tell people who buy a pot that needs to come inside for the winter um like I think that's kind of understood. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that it's nice. But, I mean, you said you don't have plants. So, I mean, you might not know. No, I would even know that. I would even know that. Yeah. Okay. Like, if I'm going to leave anything outside, I know it's going to break. Right? Mm hmm So, I think that it's not your responsibility. However, it's a nice gesture. Yeah. And I want to say Tori comments to me sometimes yeah i'm trying to see how big her planters are like is there a reason that she would not have people bring them inside but they don't look humongous it looks like she's in like dallas texas mm. doesn't ever freeze in yeah, dallas they're not, anyway they're not humongous but um but yeah, if they bought them online or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I would just put kind of a recommendation. Hey, just make sure to bring these in so they don't risk cracking. Yeah. And it, like, and honestly, the, what's the reason of leaving plants out there that are going to, they're not going to live through the winter anyways if the plants are, like, you're not watering it if the plant are fr is freezing and stuff. Like, yeah. Just bring it in. Yeah. Bring it in, bring it in. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to tell you. I, you know how I had this obsession about Encanto for a while? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you got a deep on stories about Encanto. I was like, I, I'm not even going to read all this because I don't even know what this movie is It was about, a lot. So. Anyway, um, I have the first song of Encanto stuck in my head continuously now. Like, in my brain, when I'm walking anywhere, that's what I'm singing in my head and it's really fucking annoying now. So, um... Are you walking to the beat of it? Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, Can you sing it for us? Um, I could. What is it? I don't like, know. what's the song? 
<laughs> you don't have to sing it. Just tell us what the song. What's the song? The song what it, like, is what like is it? it's the first song of the movie, and they're talking about. Um, she's talking about all the magic that everybody in the family has, and mm-hmm. um, yeah. So okay. it's just really it's really catchy. I'll send you catchy. a video okay. of it. I have to look it up. Encanto. Uh yeah. Opening song. I think you would probably like find that. it. It's like Encanto Family Madrigal. Anyway, let's move on. Uh... Oh. Hi there. I noticed Ryan using a little <laughs> sanding pad on his spoon rest the other day to smooth the bottoms, and I'm wondering if there's a reason why this is better or worse than a grinding disc on the wheel head. Which you each prefer and if there are situations where you would one would work better than the other does that make sense anyways thanks at mostly mugs yes uh sandy pad on spoon rest it's just uh, more efficient for me I, I don't like the whole like the wheel like if i put the grinding disc on the wheel i will generally keep the splash pan clean or put a towel down or something yeah cuz i do have to wet you have to wet it to keep it like a longer life so you gotta add water to it and then you sand it and holding your hand and shit and like it's just messier to do that than to just dunk the the sanding sponge and then go in a circle use a little elbow grease for like 30 seconds well i think it also matters if your piece is flat or if there's glaze on it or something like that i think that Mm -hmm. it's a it's good to use a sanding disc or put it in a gif and grip and use the pad on it mm-hmm. if it's got glaze on it or anything like that. I personally don't use my sanding disc anymore. Um, I only have a 60 grit. What anyway. was your sanding disc? It was a 60 grit disc. And it was diamond okay. core. Oh, it was. Mine's a 120. That's the lowest grit that I have. Yeah. My disc is 120 and then the sanding pad that I use on... All the other pots on a regular basis are 240. So, and that's all I sand. I'm not sanding more than a 240. So, right. And like we, when we're sanding our pots, it's not like the shitty pots, like basic bitch mugs and shitty pots. When we're sanding those, we're just sanding them to get to knock down that grit real quick. It's not to like have a smooth ass bottom or like a shiny ass, mm-hmm. you know, shiny bottom. Um, it's just so that it doesn't scratch your fucking table, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that. If you were trying, okay, if you have a Giffen grip, then I think the sanding pads are more affordable and they're more versatile. Um, if you don't have a Giffen grip and you do have a lot of runoffs, I think a sanding disc is better. But how, yeah, I mean, I think you have to, you kind of have to use the disc if you have a lot of runoffs, unless you're using like a Dremel or something like that to sand runoffs, but... That's a good point. Um, like the sanding pads are really, really intensive if it's a yeah. drip. Yeah. If there's any like bumps, like big bumps, you are going to want to use a sanding pad. Um, you mean disc. That's what I meant. Disc. Big bumps. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. you just hold the pot and then you hold it right on where that bump is and just kind of yeah. let the wheel do the work to yeah, grind so it down. Yeah. So I was wrong. But yes. Yes. So I think there are like very specific times, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I've gone the route of, you know, sanding them by hand with, you know, two and three different types of pads, but it, it wasn't worth it for me. Like I had to tell the customers, Oh, by the way, you should feel the bottom of that. It's really smooth, but like, it's not worth the time to do that Mm -hmm. for me because the customers don't notice. And if I added $5 to it, they wouldn't like, they much rather pay less for less work. Yeah, and I was making so much stuff at a time that... So I actually take a sanding disc to a shows the shows with me. So I have a 60 grit. And when somebody buys it, I just do a quick sand and then pack it up. Um, so I don't mm-hmm. actually sand it right when it comes out of the kiln or anything like that. It's usually just, you know, when I mm-hmm. take it out or when I sell it. And I'll also, if I forgot it, I will rub two pieces together on the bottom. That works just as well. Oh, I do that coming out of the kiln yeah, a lot. That works just, just as well. Just to get the little bits of kiln wash off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was, uh, I, you mentioned the price too, the 
the disc that I have is like an eight inch grinding disc. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. I kind of wish I would have got a little bit bigger one, but yeah, they're expensive. I want I want to say the disc was like fifty five bucks or yeah. something when I bought it. Do not. I'm sorry, Diamond Core. I can't. I can't. I can't help you out here. Do not get them from Diamond Core because you can buy the discs on Amazon for like twenty dollars, and the only thing that's different is it has a fucking hole in the middle. Like that's it. Is it the same kind of di like? Do they have different? Different diameters, yeah. like a six inch or eight yeah. inch or ten inch. They do, yeah. Okay, because those are meant to go on like the they're like Velcro normally, and then they Velcro. I to think a lot of them are actually sticky, but um, a polishing stone yeah. thing, and you like polish things. Yeah, I mean, like you can find them on Amazon. You just search diamond diamond sanding disc, and um, or like eight inch diamond sanding disc. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just don't, I mean, I don't use my grinding disc that much, so I've had that Diamond Core grinding disc, that 8-inch one, since 2018, and I haven't had to, as long as you keep up with it, like, you yeah. definitely need to keep it wet, that's going to lo keep longevity, even after, you know, you glaze pots and your sponge and stuff, like, let those dry out all the way, don't leave them in water and all that stuff. Yeah, but. Yeah. I mean, like, yes, I'm, I'm, I, I, like, feel bad saying, like, buy it somewhere else, but... Like, when you can find it half off someplace else, and you can find a company in the United States that makes them in America instead of making them in China, um, like somebody else we know. Um, you can find a company <laughs> that makes them in America on, you can, and you can go to Amazon, find the company, and then buy it from that company direct, um, and it's half off of what you would normally mm -hmm. pay for a certain company. That is in the ceramics community. And hey, if if you do want to spend twenty bucks, give it a go. If it works, yeah, and you think it's worth it, then buy it again when it runs out. Or yeah. If you don't need it that much, like a twenty dollar thing that you use once a month or once every three months is not that big of an investment versus something you get fifty five bucks that you're going to use once a month. Right. But if you're using something like every single week, maybe you'll see the difference. But it yeah. depends on what you what you need for the job, you know, and how much you're going to use. Like, I almost never use my grinding disc anymore because I don't have glaze runs. And if I do, usually, like, the piece is kind of ruined or it's not worth my time to sand it down. And I'm just like, right, whatever. Yeah, and you know what? Also, what you could do, if you don't want to buy a diamond one and you wanted to sand your pieces down and you had some time during this stage, you could just get them wet sand them down with a, just a regular sand pa sandpaper. Like, you could get a regular sanding disc and put it on a piece of, uh, on a bat, you know? And you sand bisqueware, is what you're saying? Yeah, you could sand the bisqueware, but I wouldn't do that. But I think that's a waste of money. But, um... I wouldn't do that for the dust that'll, I mean, and you probably don't want to be, I mean, I guess you could dunk the bisqueware in yeah, water Yeah, you dunk, you have to dunk the bisqueware. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah. Man, oh, that's how I'm going to get silicosis. I just don't like extrapolating the time it takes to sand things where it's like, that's why I do the bare minimum. Like, I didn't even start sanding stuff until last year, like the bottoms of almost every piece until last year. So, especially when I had the grittier clay, like the white clay, pretty smooth, no grog. So it's not really that big of a deal, but yeah. All right. Thanks for that question. Mostly mugs. All right. What's next? How do you recommend refiring pieces if you if the glaze didn't turn out right? Do you need to add more glaze, just put it back in this kiln, or scrap it? What is the risk of using a piece that is underfired? That came from Ryan Durbin. Oh, did Good old it? RD Ceramics. I threw that in there just because I thought it would be a good conversation. Um, it is a good... Yeah, I it like depends on what. Depends on what you mean by glaze didn't turn out right. I sometimes have pieces where there's wax on areas that don't get glazed yeah because i just wax pieces and they just don't get covered if it's in an area like on the side wall or inside on you know i'll just usually keep these bottles that have glaze in them that i use for other things around the studio and when i'm glazing things so i'll just add a little bit of extra glaze there and then let it dry like don't let gravity take hold and like let it run all the way down the pot, but like make sure it stays in that little spot. I've heard of some people like heating it up with like a heat gun mm -hmm. or, you know, putting it on a kiln that's hot and like letting the piece heat up a little bit and then putting the glaze on so it'll dry quicker. Um, but I'm not 
like if a glaze doesn't turn out perfect, I'm not that particular. Like if it's in the realm and it doesn't have like unglazed areas, then I'm fine, honestly. I'm like, it'll sell. Like it's not ideal, it's not perfect. Yes, but, but you're like... not everybody. So I'm that's my perspective <laughs> on refire. That's when I would refire something versus other things. Um, so I actually saw a video that John Britt did a while ago and it was how to refire pieces. So you could probably Google it, um, YouTube it, John Britt, um, refiring, reglazing, refiring or something. I don't know. Um, but the way that he recommends you do it is it takes a little time, but I think that it's worth it in my opinion, because I have refired quite a bit of pieces. Um, you dip it in glaze first and then you set it down upside down and you just let it dry. Like I would always set mine down on a, um, uh, a wire rack. So you set it down and you just let it dry and then, um, then you dip it again. So if you dip it once, it's not attaching to anything, so it'll be really, really thin. But if you dip it again over the dry, already dried glaze, it has something to hold on to, so it attaches to the already dried glaze. And I found that that is helpful. So that's how I always... Um, what makes it stick in the first place on the first dip? It's really thin. It's like super thin, but it just... I mean, if it's thick enough it'll there's just enough there. there's just like a and little that's why residue. you drip that's why you that's why you keep it upside down so it just drips mm -hmm. off the excess yeah it just drips off the excess and you want it on something so that air can get inside and then or like because if you're i mean and if you're doing it on the inside then it's not that hard um just pour it out but um mm -hmm. but yeah that really helped me just remember that if you put it back in um the kiln it's gonna melt a lot more so keep that in mind, if you because there's thicker glaze. Yeah, I've found that refiring things just produces longer runs, and mm -hmm. then it, it more risk to the shelf. Like that's for for me, a lot yeah. of things are not worth refiring because I'm risking the right. shelf in that aspect mostly. Yeah, and what's the risk of using a piece that is underfired, Ryan? Vit vitrification. Under fired pot, uh, I mean, it's not fully glass. I, I I think that question was mostly about, like, if it's a cone six glaze or something, it's to cone five or something, or cone four. If it's in a spot that's a little cooler, is kind of what that meant. I mean, your your glaze is not going to be fully matured, so. Yeah. That's where you probably would want to refire. And there's probably, that's probably less risky to refire because the piece hasn't got to its full melting point yeah. so there's less gravity at, in play with like glaze movement yeah if you like if the whole kiln is under fired or something like that like that's less risky to just refire it to get mm -hmm. it to the right temperature yeah yeah the the glaze uh video is called reglazing pots Okay. And that's on John Britt's page. And then he's got another one that says refiring on the side or side firing. That's probably more atmospheric firing stuff. But yeah. it looks like good old John the Potter has a how to reglaze your failed pots. So, yeah, there's a few videos out there. Cool. Wow, we've done really Alrighty. well. Wow, we've, we've like answered a lot. Okay, let's go back up to this Jody one here. Can you balance a bowl on posts if you have no more shelves or space? I wouldn't. Depends on what kind of bowl you're talking about, right? Yeah. How big the diameter of the bottom is. Touche. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking like mini pinch pot bowls, like would you do a pinch pot bowl on a post? Oh, for sure. Yeah. But So as I... long as the... I would say as long as the base of the bowl is not... There's more of the bowl sitting on the post percent like percentage wise or like diameter like there's m more mass of it on a post than not on the post. Like if you have like an inner foot and it's only resting on the inner foot and the outer foot is like hovering, I would not put that on a post. Right. Yeah, I think that yeah. I always I I wouldn't do it unless it was something very tiny. And I definitely wouldn't do it if it was flat. 
Um, because with what we're firing to, I feel like the most of the clays that we use moves a lot in the kiln. So mm-hmm. that's why I wouldn't. Even do it. if it's like my gritty red clay, yeah. like putting a spoon rest on a post that's only two inches or three inches in diameter mm-hmm. and the spoon rest is five inches in diameter, that'd be pushing it. I'm not like I might put a small plant saucer on there that's like four inches in right. diameter on a three inch post. But that's where you're kind of getting iffy. I'll definitely put shot glasses on posts all the time. Yeah. I've even done, uh, I have done spoon rest in the past where you have those like three prong triangle things like the stilts. Yeah. I'll take the stilts and flip those upside down. So usually oh, they have little, the little feet and it's kind of like a little shelf because it is supported out at near the outside diameter of a spoon rest. And I'll sit those on there. They're not supported in the middle, but it is supported on yeah. three sides, so it's kind of like flat enough. It, I mean, they look pretty jank when I load my kiln, and it's like <laughs> you've got bowls, and then you've got like a, yeah. a three prong. You got a post, and then you got a three prong stilt on top of it, hovering, and then you got a spoon rest on top. Like I've had some some kiln firings like that before, but that's where you're squeezing out every inch of the kiln that you possibly can. Yeah. But uh. Yeah, I would say you could probably do that. But I like to use my wider posts for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Have you ever broken a shelf before and then, like, kept that shelf and used it Mm -hmm. around the kiln? Yeah. Yeah. I have a shelf that's, like, a full shelf that's – it's got a crack that's maybe, like, six inches into the shelf. And it's, like, a 22-inch shelf or something like that. So, um. I have yet to, I don't want to like force it to crack, but, or like to break it in anticipation. And it's not really like warping or sagging or anything. So I, I had an advancer shelf that, um, cracked in half and it was not, how was that? I have no idea. Like it just fucking cracked and they were, they were wonderful when I like contacted them. They actually sent me a free shelf. I paid for shipping, and then I bought, like, wow. $2,000 more worth of shelves. But, you know. it. And you probably were able to use it, I would su- suppose, right? Yeah. So, Even though it was broken. Well, you were yeah, it cracked smaller. in half, and so I kept those pieces. And um, I kept those pieces, and I would, if I thought that a bowl was going to fucking just... Um, in my medium Ruin kiln, a shelf. yeah, in my medium kiln, I just put it right on top of the shelf so that I had like a safety. But um, yeah, on top of the other advancer shelf. No, on or top you of were a using regular a regular shelf. shelf. Yeah, on top of a regular. I shelf. I got you. Okay. Or, so you were kind of using like a kiln cookie. Yeah, and <laughs> and also, <laughs> also on my um in my big kiln, my oval kiln, the bottom shelf, I would try to never put anything that I thought would run on the bottom shelf because first I can't fucking reach it, second I couldn't get that. It was a full fucking shelf. Like it was, the bottom shelf was the oval. Like, mm-hmm. it was not... Oh, that's massive. You can't get that out of there by yourself. Yeah, no. Well, my friend did. My friend got it in there, but she's, like, six foot tall. Um, oh, my god. Yeah, it was... And a, then you don't want to have to re-kiln wash it and shit. Right. It was, like, a huge shelf. And so if something did... Like, I did have a few times where, like, glaze dripped down, I would just break off a piece of that um, advancer shelf and just put it right on top of the the glaze spills Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so so it was just like there it was just like sitting on that that glaze would the would the glaze like absorb into the advancer and you could like pick the advancer up and like scrape it off yeah a little bit sometimes but i didn't because i couldn't reach it but um, sometimes i'll have that happen on accident you'll have a little glaze spot on the kiln and you put like i'll put i've had like a bisque pot that i've like loaded on top of one and it like did fuse to the bottom of the pot yeah so, I mean, it's a way to, like, pick off the glaze pieces that you didn't grind off, but... Yeah. Oof. Oof, oof, oof. Okay. I'm a big fan of just I was, covering something. <laughs> I was also wondering with a cracked shelf, let's say it's my full shelf, is it better to have that crack between two posts or is it better to have that crack on a post? Like, if, if it's going to move, it seems like the support 
if it's between two posts, would put most of the weight opposite the crack. If I had a crack shelf like that, I would put four posts down. You'd put four posts, but where would the po- where would the post be? Would the post, the post would be, be on, crack, on top of the crack? On crack, across from crack, and then... Because if it did crack, it would crack straight through the middle. And then it would... And cave in. And then it would still be supported. But it's not smart to do four posts on a shelf. That can actually crack mm-hmm. your shelf. Um, mm-hmm. You know what I yeah, always I did with the crack shelves? Is I just put them on the fucking floor. Put them on the bottom? Yeah, without any posts under them. Oh, Okay. I mean, I tend to put the crack shelf on the top so there's less weight on top of it. That too, but I mean, like, I only had one crack shelf, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Like we have discussed, I keep a very, like, my shelves are fucking pristine, so Mm -hmm. I don't... And are you kiln washing them? I think I need to kiln wash them. I kiln wash them once. (laughs) <laughs> okay at the very beginning i need to re i need to redo that i think i'm gonna have my assistant do that here once it warms up a little bit yeah so because like i remember when on. i started doing kiln wash and i put way too thick of coats and it would just peel off i never want to do that again so i kiln wash them once at the beginning and if they need a second really thin coat i will do a, a thin coat maybe like once a year yeah Kiln Kiln wash is one of those things. I feel like there's no, like, uh, I don't know. It's so hit or miss. Like, the thickness, the the recipe, if you buy a recipe or if you buy a pre-mixed thing, like, it still tends to crack. But I don't know if that's because you apply it wrong. You know, I don't know if rolling is better, if painting it on is better, if, you know, I don't know if people spray it on. But, like, I feel like I always see cracking in the... Maybe I'm not putting it on thick enough, but it's... Thin. Thin enough. Yeah. You need to put it on thin. 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 So I always yeah. just do the kiln wash, and I just use alumina. I'm like, I'm over kiln wash. I just fucking sprinkle alumina on there with a little little shelt shaker. If you have a pot that's risky, is that what you're saying? No, any pot. So your alumina every single kiln shelf all the time? No, not all the time. But like if I had advancers, yes. If you have advancers, I definitely recommend putting alumina on every single shelf every single time. Um, Scrape it. Does it depend on what kind of clay you're doing? Because if you're not doing a porcelainous clay that's going to stick to the shelf, isn't that the idea behind an advancer that you don't need to put any wash on it? Bullshit. I think you need to put alumina on every single advancer shelf in my opinion. Okay. It's weird. I can't explain it, but there's like a different texture you feel. It's like if you okay. it like it just gives the you, bottom of your pot is different. No, the shelf is different. It like gives you just it's like this weird texture that you can tell that like if you leave something on there, it's just gonna like pluck. You know, it's just gonna pluck your pieces off because they're like meant to oh. absorb the clay and then take it off. Like it's just something about it. Hmm. And it, I mean, just, that's why. I- that's why Kurt puts kiln wash on his nope. because they pluck the things off his porcelain. Kind of, but Kurt also bought different advancers. So there's two types of advancer shelves. Oh, there's that's right. The ones, it has no coating on it. And right? his doesn't have a coating on it. And poor Kurt has to explain that every single fucking time he shows that he kiln washes them. And I'm so sorry, Kurt, that that happens to you because it's bullshit. <laughs> um... Uh, yeah. I mean, most people probably buy them with the coating because that's kind exactly. of the idea. That, But when you're firing you to cone 10, you don't the want the coating because blah, 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 blah. There's like just a lot of reasons. Um, yeah. Poor Kurt. Um, <laughs> Poor Kurt. Poor Kurt. Okay. Right. Let's move on. <laughs> hey, guys. Listener question for your podcast. Do you have a break it, you buy it policy when selling in person? How have you handled it when someone has broken something you have for sale? What do you say? Thanks, the Pottery Mason. The Pottery Mason. I mean, I don't really have a break your buy. I mean, if somebody's like overtly doing something that's fucking dumb, I would maybe be like, you know, you need to pay for that. But I've never had that situation. Honestly, 
usually they're more freaked out about it. So mm-hmm. I'm like, don't worry about it. If you broke it, you'd be more upset than I would. Don't worry about it. That's usually what I say. I've had a little kid break something because he bumped into my shelf on accident. And I was like, it's fine. I broke one of them this morning. (laughs) Yeah, it's like I break something every single time I come to a show. So don't worry about it. Do you like... (laughs) Have you ever done shows on cement where you like break something and it falls off the table and then you just yell out, it's fine. (laughs) No, but everybody turns their attention to that table because they're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Um, I have chased somebody down and yelled at them before. Um, Wow. Yeah. I Um, think I kind of remember this story. What was the situation? Like, why? It was like they were hanging... The pots were hanging, and they had a backpack, and they, like, fucking dropped it on the ground, and they just fucking left. They didn't even, they didn't even, like, say, I'm sorry. They just left, and I fucking chased them down. I was like, hey! <laughs> yeah! So they bumped it with their backpack, and they just dropped their backpack? No, I don't even think they dro- bumped it with their backpack. They just, like, bumped it with their shoulder or something, and it, and the cup dropped on the ground, and it broke. And then they just left. And... um. And so I chased him down. Was this down. like a young teenager or something? No, it was like a, a woman. And I'm not sure she was English speaking. Like she was, but not totally. Um, I believe she was Russian because I remember her accent. And uh, I chased her down. I was like, hey, you just broke my pot. <laughs> and I was like, you should say sorry. <laughs> yeah, when they don't even acknowledge it. They, they just like bump it and run off. Like, like don't even... It sounds funny because they, like, I picture them not even, like, looking at it. They just hear a crash and just walk off. That's exactly what they did. Yeah. Like, and not even like, being observant I enough know. to. I was like, to bullshit, you it. knew. <laughs> it's like you weren't wearing headphones or something where you were completely oblivious yeah. to bumping into something. Yeah. And um, hearing I think a it crash. It might have been Oktoberfest, which makes your anxieties higher anyway. But, um,. Yeah, I don't have a break it, you buy it policy. If I had like a billion dollar cups, I might have a you break it, you buy it policy. Um, but even then, probably not. We're schlepping no. shitty pots and basic bitch pots. Like, I'm more a you know, fan we're of breaking making, stuff on a regular basic. Yeah, I'm more a basis. fan of making people feel really bad than saying you have to buy it. <laughs> Like, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on their demeanor. Like yeah. most of the people's demeanor when they accidentally drop, usually they're like drinking out of something and they accidentally like drop it or they they're, you know, they're holding it on the table and they accidentally drop something or they have a bag and they sit it down on a pot and it clanks or something. Yeah. If that wasn't, and, if uh, that happened, I'd be like, and they're it's usually fine. like, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. If that happened, it would be fine. Um, but surprisingly, yeah, I haven't had people like, knock a table and like a shot glass falls on the ground or you know they try to take a mug off the hanging rack and it falls down or they drop it like yeah yeah that hasn't happened yeah. i'll usually like kind of bump my oil bottles sometimes when i'm like reaching over the table to like get their card or something because the oil bottles are like right at my like chest level yeah so sometimes i like bump the little you know spouts sticking up and then like kind of jostle it but i would venture to say that a break it you buy it situation is actually really bad for business because of this um typically if you say you break it you buy it you have a sign that says that and if you have a sign that says that that encourages you not to touch anything in your booth and touching anything is what sells your pieces so i i think that that's just the um it's cost of doing business. Yeah, it's just cost of doing business. Yeah, definitely. Like you see those uh like sometimes I'll see the signs that say like no photography, blah 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 blah. Like I get it for photographers, but it's like I don't want to look at this booth. They don't want me to photograph anything. Like Or they'll be like snippy about That's a like, terrible example, Ryan. <laughs> I don't know. That's just something that turns me off when I go into a booth and I'm like it says no photography. You shouldn't be taking pictures of shit anyway. You're just going to, like, take the picture and then steal their idea. That's the point. 
I get it, but I'm taking, I'm not taking a picture like straight on for stuff like that. I'm taking a picture like of the booth so you can be like, that's a cool booth or that's a cool take on something. It's not like I'm taking this photo. I think it's appropriate to ask them if you can take a picture. Depends on what it is. I mean, I would assume two dimensional asking is appropriate. If it's three dimensional, do people generally give a shit if you're taking a picture of a 3D thing? I think sometimes, yeah. Yeah? Like, I don't care if you take a picture huh. of my booth, but... Yeah. Hmm. Okay. There's a really long question All about right. vitrification. That's a old Lindy. Oh, Lindy. There's a lot Do we want to book in with the Lindy one? Do you want to read the one after and then come back to Lindy? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Wondering if you could point me towards any episodes where you talk about warping. My hand-built mugs and bowls have been warping oval from round, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, oh, what I might be doing to cause this and how to avoid this in the future. Megan, hey, that's the same person. I think it's the same person. I think they changed their name. Kitchy? Kitchy Pottery. Megan Kitchy Potter? Megan Sitchy Pottery? Now I'm butchering the name. Anyway, that is a <laughs> whole thing. Should I take this because I've done hand building and you have? Yes. Yes, okay. definitely. Yeah, That's I've seen whole... Megan come across my stuff before. That is a whole... I feel like that's a whole fucking episode. I don't know. Um, Or not. It, it all depends on how you're making your pieces, but... If they're warping from oval to round, there's two options, especially for your mugs. You might be putting on your handles you mean way round too round to oval. That's what I meant. You might be putting on your handles way too early. You might not be letting them set up long enough. Um, set up long enough and uh, uh, in order like especially the mugs in order to um, keep their shape. Um, bowls. If you're using a press mold or a, like, I don't know, fucking GR form or whatever, like a bisque mold or whatever, um, that can definitely happen when you fucking move it. Like, just when you move it, it can totally warp the board. So if you're doing a press mold, make sure you're... Um, what I would do, what I do is when I do a press mold, I do it on top of my banding wheel but if you if it's too big do it on something and then press the foam down onto the board press the foam down onto the board instead of pressing the the bowl into the foam so like instead of having the foam on the table and pressing the the bowl into the foam you want to flip that over have the bowl upside down essentially press the on a solid piece on a solid piece press the foam and use a board on top of the foam to press down or not. I mean, you can mold it around. That's fine, too. And then what you can do is you can take a flat board or a bat and put that on the bottom of the bowl. And then you can flip it over. And flipping that over with the mold still in it allows the... Um, allows it to kind of stay in place and then you can take the mold out. So, um, a lot of people will press I it into that. the, f yeah. did you, did that make sense how I said it verbally? I think that made sense. Okay. A lot of people press their bowls. I didn't realize you did that cause I've seen you do the mise en place and that is, mise en place are so tiny. Opposite. Yeah. Um, a lot of people do the bowls and they press it into the foam and then they'll put their hands under the bowl and move the bowl that's going to warp your your bowls like immediately. You can also let them set up a little bit on your mold and do something else for a second and then come back. Um, that can help with warping. It um, totally matters how you're bisking them, how you're glaze firing them. Um, oof. It matters what type of clay you're using. It, <laughs> like so Yeah, many like things. is the is there, like, you want at least a fine grog or a mm -hmm. low grog yeah. to hold the shape more? Yeah. I would guess you don't want, like, really soft clay. You probably want, like, 
medium to medium firm. I mean, I was still using Depends porcelain. Depends on what form you're building, but... Yeah, I was still using for porcelain. I just think it really matters what you're laying your pieces on. If you're laying on them on a board that's warped, you're fucked. Like... You know, it really matters what you're putting your pieces on. You can put paper down so that they shrink evenly. That's always good. Um, the uh, You mentioned the boards. Like, is it ideal to do it on, like, what would be the difference between, like, a drywall board versus a plastic bat? The plastic bat's not going to absorb anything. The drywall board's going to absorb a little bit of something. Yeah, I would do it on drywall or hardy backer or if you have... Man, I had the best, the fucking best hand building tables back in Washington. They were IKEA tables, and they were unsan, they were un uh, stained. And I actually still, I have tables like them up in my studio, but um, oh, sorry, in my apartment. But um, if you can just set them out on the table and let them firm up, or even on bats, um, but not plastic bats, like you said, just to let them firm up, or plaster, or whatever. Um, that would be ideal until it's firm enough. And also, if it's got a flat bottom, I use bean bags. Um, I, I have the, these, uh, bags with, uh, their, their cloth bags and they're full of beans. And I use those to put on my plates so that they don't warp and like lift up the edges. Um, mm -hmm. God, there's so many things like hand building is a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Wow. Yeah, it looks like she's got a variety of different things on here. Um, looks like she does quite a bit of throwing. Uh, as well as, yeah, there's some mugs in here that look like they might be hand-built. Yeah, I, I can imagine the handle part, attaching the handle at the right stage, because the handle, if it's too moist, then it'll add moisture to that part of the body and then if the other parts of the body aren't drying at the same consistency the handle is going to kind of it's going to pull in the away from the handle or something like as mm -hmm. it shrinks or as it dries oh is that what it tends to do normally is it ovals like long ways with the handle like <laughs> the handle and the opposite side of the Oh, sorry. Like a large serving bowl. So it looks like her bowl. I, are you seeing that big bowl? And it looks like one of did? her bowls. Yeah, it's like coil built, coil slab built kind of. Yeah. So what over I would do. Over top of a form. Mm -hmm. So what I would do if with that is maybe leave it on the form for a little bit longer because your clay is like retaining its memory. Um. Because yeah. she's, she's joining everything on the inside when she takes it out and then it's kind of sitting on top of a board in a, yeah. it looked like it was inside a banding wheel maybe. Mm -hmm. What about keeping your pots? So if it's something that is like inside out, is it better to let pots dry bottom side down so that the inside gets air on the top? Or is it better to hover them and like elevate them so the bottom dries? I think you want it to dry as evenly as possible. Um, Megan, I also, I have an idea. And um, my idea is I would recommend for your large bowls, it looks like they're pretty consistently the same size because you have it on a form. What I would recommend is instead of doing a mold on the outside I would maybe mold it on the inside of a bowl and um like a drape mold instead of a hump mold yes drape um, is kind of like you put it inside yeah but she's coiling so if you could coil it on the inside let it stiffen up and then go on the outside and then smooth out your clay on the outside and like maybe if you had a two-part system where you know you had a bisque bowl that was the size that you want on the outside and then you figured out how you could kind of sandwich them flip it over and then work on the outside um that's probably what i would do and make sure that when mm -hmm. you have your mold that you're putting on the inside, 
um, if you make a bisque mold or something like that, like what I would do is probably just use a bowl that you've made because it's already shrunken probably to the size that you want it to be. And, but I would put handles in it somehow so you can lift it up and lift it down, um, lift it up and down, you know, and, but I would probably, if you can coil the bowl inside a larger bisque bowl and then flip it over onto the, like put the other bowl inside and then flip it over and then work on the outside. That's what I would probably do if I wanted them to. Oh, so like, uh, yeah, I gotcha. So if I wanted it to not work So like one bisque bowl is to slump into and then the other bisque bowl is to transfer to as kind of like a hump mold yeah it's exactly. really just your work your working yeah surface and and oh, okay. then i would leave it on that mold as much as i can as long as i can to get it and then i would maybe transfer it back to that bowl that is the out you know the outside bowl the hump mold uh, the slump mold whatever that the bigger bowl slump mold, yeah to dry Well, yeah, it's, and obviously it gives it more room to shrink. You have to take it off the physical piece that's not going to shrink because your right. bowl is going to start to crack and have issues if you leave it on a solid piece that right. you're draping it over. Yeah. Okay. I I mean, I tend to notice that, like, cereal bowls that I'll take off the bats and put bottom side up, they will tend to creep up in the middle. So I do notice that, and then, like, if I trim it, I need to make sure to, I don't know, it's easier for me to keep them flat if I keep it bottom side down on drywall, or, yeah, yeah, like the drywall board to let stuff dry, but also my bottoms are fairly thin, but to keep them the flattest possible, I don't let stuff dry upside down if I don't have to. Yeah. Do you know what I think I'm going to do this summer at shows? No, what are you going to do? I want to try and get into a farmer's market, but I think I'm just going to do fucking planters. But but mostly, I just kind of want to do like planter plates, plant steaks, and maybe planters. Planter plates like just random saucers? Yeah. I feel like planter plates are really hard to find. I mean, I get some sales of the saucers on my Etsy shop. Yeah. I miss hand building. Every now and then. I'm not sell I'm not selling a ton of them, but yeah, I kind of like what uh, I think Val Flynn was making some like that, right? She makes some that are, or maybe does Rebecca mm-hmm. make some small ones like that? Yeah, I miss hand building, and maybe I could get on fair and do wholesale planter plates. I'd fucking love that, and I know that some of my old wholesale clients would love it. Anyway, uh, do you want to do that last question? Yeah, let's go to Lindy here. Do you want to read it or you want me to? No. Can you read it? It's really long. I might sneeze midway through. Okay, um, I'll read it. I'll read it. Hey, R&B. Ha ha. Get it? Question mark. Exclamation point. Question mark. Exclamation point. Et cetera, et cetera. Didn't you oh, guys... Oh, we get it. <laughs> Didn't you guys do a cast about vitrification absorption? Question mark. Question mark. I'm testing out a new clay for vitrification absorption. <laughs> slash absorption weighed the mug fresh out of the glaze firing it weighed 226 grams submerged it in water for 24 hours dried it off well and weighed it again it weighed 228 grams did some math maths (laughs) plural and came out with an absorption rate of 0.87 the new clay, 0.87%, the new clay needs to be fired hotter than my usual clay. So I also tested it, tested out the clay firing to my usual cone six with a five minute hold. Nice, Lindy. Um, popped a piece using the new clay in with the glaze firing as my usual of my usual clay. And then testing for absorption this time, the start weight was 274 and end weight was 281. So 2.5 absorption. Do you think 2.5 is okay? Question mark. Just thinking for ease of You're firing. reading every fucking character here. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking for ease of firing. Dash. I hate having clays that fire to different cones. But I've had issues sourcing my usual clay. So 
want to have a backup if I end up in this position again. Someone told me I needed to test a small class. Someone told me I needed to do a test, a small slab fired to full vitrification, then do a 24 hour soak test. Lindy. Lindy Garner ceramics. <laughs> Period. Period. <laughs> Okay, so her math checks out, by the way. Uh, all right, so she's she's figuring out these clay bodies. 1% absorption, old clay body. 2.5% new clay body. And trying to figure out what to go with. If 2.5 is good enough. Honestly, 2.5 is good enough in my book. Like, the shift that you'd have to make, like, your glazes could look different if you try to fire to match the full 1% absorption of your clay like if you had to fire your clay to cone seven to get to one percent or whatever you want it to be like your glazes are not going to look the same at cone seven as they do at cone six so like for me it's worth the trade-off to just keep it at 2.5 god i can't even imagine how many pieces i have out in the wild that are probably at like six percent absorption (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> spitting on bottoms of pots and you're like that's not good yeah i think it's fine yeah very th- very thorough with your testing lindy i like it yeah somebody's been listening to some some podcast i'm here. gonna be honest i thought this this question was gonna be a doozy but it really wasn't and i feel like you did a really good job at explaining absorption to all the people that are having issues with it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you need to do with the weighing and the submerging in water. Like, yeah. that's exactly what you need to be doing. Yeah. Solid. Love it. Wow. All right. It's one hour and 56 minutes. Look, Look at, at that. It's not even, not even midnight. I also wanted to tell people, um, we're going to try to record it next week, but um, me and Ryan... Also, for the lady that emailed me, like at the Ryan and I, the lady that emailed me at the very, very beginning of us starting the podcast, telling me that I should use proper grammar and say Ryan and I instead of me and Ryan. This is for you. Um, I think of you every time I say. Wait, me and Ryan. you do that on purpose now? Yeah, because I hear it all the time, and I'm like, it's not right, but I can't tell Becca, even though I would tell Becca. <laughs> <laughs> so you do it on purpose every time. <laughs> <laughs> i think i mentioned that to somebody a couple weeks ago i was like yeah and when becca says me and ryan all the time and i'm like what the fuck becca <laughs> honestly it's not intentional all the time but most of the time it is Okay. Um, I think now that, that it, it's, all right. Where were you going with that? I, I think, think it's I subconsciously it. <laughs> intentional because it was so intentional when she sent that email at the beginning. Anyway, um, we, Ryan and I, are watching um, the Formula One <laughs> Drive to Survive. Formula One Drive to Survive. Every on week, Netflix. we've decided that we're going to watch one episode every week so that we can we can. Uh, uh, spread it out drag it out yeah spread Ooh, it out drag it I think out it's about nice. 10 episodes yeah 10 episodes so if you watch formula one drive to survive you can watch them with us <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh we'll and be for talking... those of you that got that comment at the beginning yeah that's what that was in reference to yeah so for those of you that didn't get the lights out and away we go yeah that's what it was that's a formula we're one fucking reference nerds. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> And the season starts this weekend, so it's March 16th right now. Do we need to get new tickets to the, um, there's two, I don't even, there's two American know, ones. There's, there's one in Arizona. I know. And one in, um. Not Arizona. There, Austin, Texas and Miami, Florida. I thought it was Arizona. It's Austin, Texas. Let's go to the Texas Are you bummed that, well, yeah, the Miami one, I was looking tickets up. It's the very first time it's been in Miami. Tickets are fucking outrageous. What's like fucking two outrageous? grand. Oh, fuck that two shit. Two grand. We, we're not doing that. Yeah, hmm. Texas one has been around, and I think the general public ones are going to go on sale soon. 
but it's still gonna be like depends on if you want to go for like a day or if you want to go for the weekend because it's like friday saturday sunday Mm -hmm. Friday is free practice one and free practice two, which is where they're just kind of testing out their cars on the track and seeing how the tires are doing. Saturday is qualifying. Right. Which there's a bunch of cars out at the same time and they're actually like, they dwindle down who gets, you know, 20 versus 15 and then that's qualifying one. And then qualifying two is like who gets down to 10 versus 15. And then the last qualifying is another section of time and that's to to build out the places from one to ten and then sunday is the race so and the race is about two hours but yeah the weekend is like uh it's gonna be like 500 bucks or something like holy shit (laughs) i just looked it up (laughs) fuck man so i i put my name on the email list for when the tickets go on sale because I looked on secondary markets like StubHub and stuff, and they're like, it's like 500 for the weekend. But I mean, that's not um, that bad. I mean, it's a one time thing. Like, we're, I'm not going to this every fucking year. No. There's ones that are like. I would love four. to go to the Miami one at some time, general, but not general, this year because it's the first time. General admission is 380. Uh, the turn 19 bleachers are 415. So. Um, what is that for the three day weekend? Or is that for one day? Mm. Usually they'll say Friday only, Saturday. Three-day tickets. Three-day tickets, yeah. Yeah. That's what I'd like to do. Yeah, I think the three-day would be best. And I think we should have some place to sit. Yeah. I don't I don't know what general mission is. I don't know if that's like a berm, like the lawn. Oh, I wouldn't like I wouldn't mind lawn. Yeah. I mean general mission is not standing room only. That's not what that means. Let's see. They had a map. Anyway, we're doing this on here. Um, yeah. So if you wanna if you wanna follow along with the Drive to Survive, if you've never watched it, if you don't know Formula One or anything, I would say start season one. That's honestly what got me hooked on Formula One. Yeah. So Netflix does a good job of, and I think that's a big driver for like building up the U.S. fan base of Formula One in really? the last like three yeah, to four definitely. years because of Netflix. Yeah. So, I mean, by the time we fly there, stay there, drive around, and the tickets for that, like, what's that going to be? <laughs> and then I'm like, does Rachel even want to go, or is it just you and I going to the races and stuff? Like, I don't know. I think that Rachel <laughs> should probably just stay home for this one. <laughs> I mean, I think she would go to the race. She would go to it over... I would... Uh, I mean, Indy has races and stuff. I wonder if it would be worth like going to an Indy race. Oh, we should definitely go to an Indy race. I really, really want to go. I really want to go to an Indy race. What if... Uh, I don't want to commit to it, but what if we just went to an Indy race this year and then went to an F1 race next year? Yeah, and we could... I'm putting away money. Because then we don't have to drive... We don't have to fly anywhere. You don't have to... St- you just go to the race. And, and you can stay with me. Local. Yeah. It's local, so. And I'm putting away money every month that I don't spend in cash because I've switched to a cash budget in my little jar. So that should add up to at least $400 um, by the end of the year. And the Indy race is not going to be that much. No. Like, it's not a Formula One race. It's not a one time in the whole season race. Yeah. Like they have it all the time. So, so Formula One will shoot for 2023. I like it. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Yeah, and the and the Miami one is actually held on the day of spring fair this year. So obviously I wasn't gonna go for that. Plus obviously. it's the first year and I figured there'd be a lot of hype and the dollar dollar signs of these tickets are outrageous. Yeah. It's probably because it's like Miami, which I don't know, people party like crazy. So So I think that we I'm could sure go to that. a Grand Prix in Indy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know there's actually an old Formula One racer that's raced in those do you know who i'm talking about roman groschon oh really he raced for he raced for haas until he i think he got let go a couple years ago 
couple years. Do you did you know about his race a couple years ago? It's on the third season. He's the one that like got in that big crash where there was oh, fire. Oh, the fire, yeah. And he literally walked out of the fiery mm-hmm. car. Oh man, that was nuts. Yeah, he's racing in IndyCar now. That's cool. So, I've never been to a racetrack at all like NASCAR or IndyCar or anything, so got to break that break that bubble. You got to Yeah. I know what to expect. I just picture it being hot as balls out there <laughs> and sunscreen out the wazoo and got to take a hat. We're going to get you a, a straw hat. Like the white man you are. Like a sombrero. Just get a big, huge sombrero that just covers all of me. (laughs) Yeah. I wish I would have gone to more races when I was in California because the speedway is in uh, Riverside. And we were so close to that. And I love love racing. What do they race there? NASCAR. Oh, okay. I'm a NASCAR fan. I saw that. Okay. I saw they started NASCAR inside of the Rose Bowl, Los Angeles Coliseum. It looked ridiculous. <laughs> they called it the Clash or something. It's like they're literally riding a, a NASCAR around the size of a football field. Like, what the fuck are they doing here? The Coliseum is huge, though. That, that Rose Bowl I know, but Coliseum it's like, huge. how big can it really... <laughs> like, I watched some of it because we were at a restaurant and it was on, and I was like, like, how much action is there really... There's not a lot of action. Like, so that's how big these, um, that's how big the uh, track in Monroe is. It's, like, really tiny because it's just local, like, Yeah, I mean, I get know, it if you're in, like, a little, stuff. like, dirt dirt car or something or, yeah. like, a, yeah. yeah, like, a, I'm trying to think of, like, a four-wheel dirt with a, like, buggy kind of thing, like, those kind of racing things. A buggy. A Are they called buggy. buggies? Dune, dune buggy, yeah. 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 Uh, Andrew has one of those. His dad made one. It's really cool. Really? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so we'll plan for that. We'll look out at the calendar and see when uh, we can do an Indy race. Yeah. Did you know the prices were that outrageous for I did F1? not. I did not. <laughs> I knew there were going to be a lot. I knew it was going to be at least like 300 bucks, but I didn't know. I mean, I'm not surprised, but I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, we should The go. action, yeah, the action for a 2021 race wasn't really that exciting. The race wasn't that great, honestly. Yeah. It's a pretty fast track, so whoever's out front pretty much stays out in front, and there's not, unless there's crashes or something, but. Yeah. You know what would be funny is to go to, um, I was in Long Beach when they had the Grand Prix. That was really cool. The Long Beach Grand Prix was really cool. Sweet. Anyway, okay, let's go. It's 12 o'clock. I want to sleep. You want to sleep. Right. We all want to sleep. Thanks, sleep. everybody, for listening. Bye. 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 Yo, yo, higgity, yo. It's Becca here. Hey, just so you know, thank you for listening. And also, we have, what do we have again? A Patreon. We have a Patreon that you should go and if you want to donate to, you could donate to it. If you don't, that's cool too. But um, just Google Wheel Talk Podcast Patreon. Don't do the other one uh, because there is a Wheel Talk on Patreon, but it's not us. So make sure you get the right one. And it's in the show notes. And also um, leave us a review because they're fun to read. Okay, bye.